Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where you go for horrible facts to torment your friends with. It's time for another look at the deadly decade that is the 1980s. Death, destruction, corruption, murder, and mayhem were the inspiration for nearly 10 years of decadence. This time we focus on the year 1986. The Challenger explosion and the Chernobyl disaster were two of the worst things to happen that year, but we're not going to discuss that at all. Instead, we are going to focus on the mostly forgotten events, such as our first story about a train accident in Canada. Hinton Train Collision The railroad industry has a lot of safety requirements. Sometimes they are ignored and it can have deadly consequences. The Canadian National Railroad carries a lot of freight and people. This was true in the 1980s as well. When everything worked as intended, it was a safe and efficient way to move products and people. On the morning of February 8, 1986, all of the safeguards would fail. Early that morning, a passenger train left Jasper and began traveling east to Edmonton. There were 115 people on board, 94 of which were passengers. Also present on the track that morning was a freight train. It left from Edson and was headed in the direction of Jasper. As the freight train started to enter the section of track shared by the passenger train, it encountered a signal which told it to stop. However, the freight train did not stop. It blew past the signal at nearly 60 miles per hour. Freight trains were never supposed to exceed 50 miles per hour. 18 seconds after blowing past the stop signal, the freight train ran into the passenger train. The locomotives of both trains collided, killing the crews of both instantly. The passenger train was crushed as well. Several of the passenger cars were buried beneath debris from the freight cars. Help arrived quickly and they began trying to dig victims out of the wreckage. In the end, there were 23 people killed and 71 injured. The Canadian government began an investigation into the crash. The final report concluded that a culture among railroad workers sacrificed safety for efficiency. Crews would leave and enter trains without the train stopping first, which was a violation of safety procedures. Engineers were supposed to keep a pedal pressed on the locomotive so that if they fell asleep and let go of the pedal, the train would stop. The commission found most engineers just put a rock on the pedal to keep it pressed. Ultimately, they never figured out exactly why the freight train ignored the stop signal. The engineer could have been asleep. It was also discovered that he had numerous health problems and probably shouldn't have been allowed to drive a train. In the end, nobody was arrested or convicted for causing the accident. The reason why is because those most directly responsible were dead. Swedish Assassination Sweden isn't typically known for being a violent country, but in 1986, murder was in the air. Olaf Palma was born on January 30, 1927 in Stockholm. He was a sickly child but grew into a mostly healthy adult. Olaf served in the military during World War II. Then in 1949, he traveled to the United States and spent a year hitchhiking through the country. Olaf would later mention that seeing the wealth disparity between rich and poor people during his travels helped make him a socialist. He was elected to the Swedish parliament in 1957. And in 1982, he was elected prime minister. But Olaf also had a habit of making enemies. He helped give more power to labor unions, which angered business owners. The laws he helped pass concerning job security were also not popular with the merchant class. Olaf also helped reform education and child care, and he spoke about gender equality often. Additionally, he was one of the first political leaders to care about the environment. He began advocating for the use of nuclear power. Olaf also spoke publicly against the United States and the environmental damage caused by the Vietnam War. Despite creating political opponents at every opportunity, Olaf traveled without any bodyguards. Around midnight on February 28, 1986, he was leaving a movie with his wife. They were walking home down the street in Stockholm. Suddenly, someone walked up and shot Olaf in the back, killing him. Authorities were not able to find the killer right away. In 1989, a petty criminal named Christer Peterson was convicted of the murder. However, the conviction was overturned a year later when the courts decided there wasn't enough evidence to prove he killed the prime minister. Another suspect was located. However, following the assassination, he moved to the United States. 
He was killed in 1994 after becoming involved with another man's wife. On June 10, 2020, Swedish investigators announced they finally knew who killed Olaf. It was Stig Engström, a graphic designer who was originally interviewed as a witness to the murder, but he committed suicide in 2000. Since the assassin was dead, the case was finally closed. Hotel New World The country of Singapore constructed a lot of buildings in the 1970s, and not all of them were safe. The building that contained Hotel New World was completed in 1971. It was six stories tall and had a basement parking garage, too. The first problem was discovered in 1975. Poisonous carbon monoxide gas leaked into several rooms, which could have killed guests. Thankfully, the leak was fixed, but the building still had issues. By 1986, the Hotel New World building contained several more businesses. There was a bank on the top floor, and on the second floor was a nightclub. On the morning of March 15th, around 11.25 a.m., the building suddenly and rapidly collapsed. In less than a minute, the structure was completely transformed into a pile of rubble and dust. At first, rescuers thought there might be more than 300 people trapped beneath the debris. They didn't have the equipment to rescue them, however, not far from the disaster, tunneling experts from various countries were building a subway system. They offered to help. In the end, it turned out that there were fewer people in the building than expected. Only 33 were killed by the collapse. The Singapore investigative team spent a lot of time trying to figure out what happened. They tested the concrete, checked for potential gas explosions, and it checked the load-bearing capacity of various structures. What they discovered was that the original structural engineer didn't use the correct calculations. The Hotel New World building couldn't even support its own weight. It was a miracle it didn't collapse sooner. The Singaporean government inspected all buildings constructed in the 1970s. Those that couldn't be repaired were demolished. Russell Street Bombing Australia was an extremely violent place in the 1980s, and sometimes police officers were the ones who paid the ultimate price. Russell Street was located in Melbourne. It was also where the police headquarters were located. And on March 27, 1986, it became the site of a deadly explosion. A 1979 Holden Commodore parked near the building early that morning. At 1 p.m., explosives within the vehicle detonated. Because the offices in the police station used an open office plan, the items in the building became shrapnel. It injured 21 people. A 21-year-old police constable named Angela Rose Taylor succumbed to her injuries a month later, making her the first policewoman in Australia to die in the line of duty. Police began trying to figure out who did this. They soon discovered it was due to several people and a complicated series of events. In 1985, explosives were stolen from a nearby mine. Then, just two days before the explosion, the Holden Commodore was stolen as well. Clearly, the attack had been planned for some time, but they couldn't figure out who did it. In April, a witness came forward saying she saw the man who parked the stolen car. They determined he was a known criminal named Peter Reed. When police showed up at his house on April 25th, Peter began firing at them with a revolver, injuring one detective. After subduing Peter and searching the house, the investigation led to several more culprits. Two of the main ones were Craig Minogue and Stanley Brian Taylor, who were arrested soon after Peter. The motivation for the attack was that all of them hated the police. Peter was cleared in the bombing, but went to prison for 12 years for shooting at police. Craig and Stanley were convicted of murder and sent to prison for life. Stanley died in prison, but Craig is still alive. In 2012, he was awarded a PhD in applied ethics. For public safety reasons, access to his thesis is restricted. FBI Miami Shootout Before the year was over, Florida would also make its own contribution to the cause of senseless violence. Michael Platt and William Mattix met while serving in the Army at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. They became very good friends. After leaving military service in the mid-1970s, they both moved to Columbus, Ohio, and they each got married as well. In 1983, Michael and William were in their early 30s. William's wife was a cancer researcher. On December 30th, she was found stabbed to death in the hospital where she worked. The police suspected William, but could never charge him. On December 21st, 1984, Michael's wife was found dead. She had taken a shotgun blast to the mouth. 
her death was ruled a suicide. In 1985, the friends decided that they needed to move. They relocated to Florida and opened a tree trimming business, and it wouldn't take long for them to also start murdering the locals. On October 5th, Michael and William found a man target shooting at a nearby quarry. They killed him, then used his car in a series of robberies. Several days later, they then tried to rob a Wells Fargo armored car. Michael and William both opened fire, killing a guard. The other guards returned fire, forcing the pair to leave without stealing anything. However, on November 8th, they would finally succeed in making crime pay. At a bank in Miami, they shot an armored car guard in the back as he was opening the doors. The men escaped with $54,000. The guard survived, but had over 100 shotgun pellets removed from his body. Michael and William had no plans to stop their crime spree. On March 12th, they found someone shooting at targets in the Everglades. They shot the man and stole his Chevrolet Monte Carlo. The victim survived the shooting, but had to walk three miles to find help. Then on March 19th, they returned to the bank where they had shot the guard. This time, they left with over $8,000. Michael and William's violent escapades had attracted the attention of the FBI. On the morning of April 11th, a team of agents met at the Home Depot in Miami. The plan was to stake out the area and find the Monte Carlo that Michael and William were driving. Two agents, Jerry Dove and Ben Grogan, spotted the men around 9.30 a.m. They followed until Miami police attempted to make a traffic stop. As the police car's lights turned on, Michael and William tried to run. Their car ran off the road and into a tree in front of a house. As the car ran off the road, it hit several of the vehicles driven by the FBI agents. Many of them had put their revolvers on the passenger seat in anticipation of a gunfight. The weapons were knocked away after being hit by the Monte Carlo. Michael and William began climbing out of the car while shooting. William was shot in the arm and then wounded the agent in return. The pair moved, wounding FBI agents as they did. Jerry and Ben were huddled behind their car, trying to fix a jammed gun. They didn't notice when Michael and William walked up to them. Both of the agents were killed. As Michael and William tried to escape in another stolen car, Ed Miralis, a wounded agent, walked forward, shooting at them several times with a shotgun. He hit Michael in the feet. As the men tried to drive away, Ed drew his 357 revolver and walked toward them. He released six shots, killing both men and ending the gunfight. Five FBI agents were injured during the battle, and two were killed. After reviewing the details of the battle, the FBI decided to make some changes. Agents began using semi-automatic handguns instead of revolvers. They were issued more shotguns, and agents were given more effective body armor. We learn a lot from making these episodes. Mostly, we have learned that death is everywhere, lurking, waiting for you to make a mistake. And you will. But in the meantime, we hope you'll lead a long and happy life. Most importantly, keep watching our channel. We're here to ensure your mood is correctly calibrated. You're welcome. And don't forget to like this video and subscribe. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.